All right, it's now recording. And the broadcast will start in about three minutes. Hey, Martin, could you go ahead and give me a keyboard and mouse controls? Uh-huh. Great. Okay, I'm back. Great. Still got a couple more minutes here. Is everyone ready? I am. I am. Gary's right. ready. Mark's yeah. ready. Yep. Yeah. I'm going to mute okay. myself. All right. Here we go. Yeah, the, yeah, the polls, is, polls are four or five slides in, so. Okay, I can't uh, see. Um... The thing. I can't see the taskbar. Shit! Wait! 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 Nathan! Wait! We're wait. On here. Okay, I can't wait. see. The... Wait. I'm in the ta I can't see the taskbar. Hang on. One moment, everyone. Usually when I lose my control panel, I see the the flower symbol oh, I, I on I my taskbar, and I click it. Okay, I got it. I got it, Nathan. Okay. All right. Apologies, everyone. Uh, welcome today, and thank you for joining the webinar. Uh, today's webinar is another in the Transportation Site Impact and Access Management webinar series, which is hosted by the Florida Department of Transportation Systems Management Office. My name is Nathan Hicks, and I'm with CDM Smith, and will be assisting with the hosting of this webinar today. Joining us today is Gary Socklow from FDOT Systems Management Office, as well as Martin Guttenplan, Amy Longstreet, 
and Mike Stafford, who are all also with CDM Smith. As of right now, everyone is muted in order to reduce any background noise. If you have a question, though, please raise a hand in, the in your control panel or type a question into the question tab. We'll be answering the questions throughout the webinar. Before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items to discuss. Uh, we will be sending a copy of the presentation along with other supplemental information a day or so after this webinar. And there will also be a recording, but there will be no credit for attending the webinar uh, through the recording itself. There are also uh, credits for prof professional organizations. If you are looking for CM credits, please use the number that is on the screen. And if you're looking for PDH credits, the attendance sheet that we send in a few days will help with that. At this time, we have a few more, a few polls to ask of you all, and I'll turn that over to Gary. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch this poll to ask you, uh, who do you represent? So get an idea of our, of our audience out there. I'll give it a little bit more chance. All right. I will now close the poll since most of you have answered. And I will share it with you so you get a chance to see that uh, most of you are with consulting firms. And uh, we have some good representation from local government and, and DOT. And I'm very impressed with the people who represent themselves. You know that uh, uh, appreciate you you coming on, even if your boss isn't making you. All right, and with that, I will hand the presentation back. All right, and we do have a few more polls actually as well. Okay. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, I didn't. I didn't catch that next slide. But uh, hey, are you in Florida or not? So just let me know. Sorry about that, Nathan. That's fine. I did not realize one was coming right after the other. Okay. I should have primed it a little more. <laughs> We've got about three fourths have been voted. <laughs> yeah. I'll close it right now. Oh. All right. And I will share it with the people out there. Most of you are uh, Florida people. Okay. And when we view the uh, um, the attendee uh, report, we'll get to see what states and even sometimes countries you all come from. I'm going to hand this back over to you and try to um, do a better job there, Nathan. Oh, okay. <laughs> how often do you work with access management issues? That's a good one here. Um, okay, I'm going to launch this one. Access management is my life, not necessarily yours. <laughs> <laughs> Give a little bit more time for those of you that sometimes you're sitting there and you're not close to the machine. All right, almost 80% of you have voted, so I'm going to show everyone what it says. And yeah, 13% of these people, access management is their lives. Yeah. I would say if you did it once a week, it's your life too. So you're in good company here, access management nerds. 
<laughs> All right, I'm going to hand it back to you now. And Great, thank you, Gary. All right. All right, okay. Well, until well, in today's webinar, we'll focus on the recently completed access management practices and design for complete streets report for the systems management office at DOT. We will review current multimodal access management problems, some solutions and, and implementations, as well as some short versus long-term solutions. Finally, we'll talk about what's next and some next steps and where to go from here. When traditionally thinking of access management, there has long been a focus on vehicular needs. Now though, there is a greater need to incorporate other modes of the access management philosophy and to take those modes into stronger consideration. Access management at its core is essentially conflict management, managing the conflicts between different modes of transportation. You can see from this figure, and then in this one, the addition of the median allowed for less conflict points and for many of them to be reduced and or removed completely. This sort of idea of access management can benefit not only just at vehicular needs, but also for multimodal and to take that into greater consideration is, a, is an important concept and can provide greater safety for everyone. Overall, there are a multitude of resources that were reviewed in the writing of this report, including the most recent access management manual from TRB, uh, the separated bike lane and planning design guide from FHWA, and the smart transportation guidebook from New Jersey and PennDOT. Also including those was the FDOT Freight Roadwide Roadway Design Considerations document and the FHWA Achieving Multimodal Networks, North Carolina Complete Streets Planning and Design, Guide, Design Guidelines, and the still in draft Orange County, Florida I Drive Overlay Zone, and the upcoming FDOT Complete Streets Implementation Plan. While these documents were considered to be a draft, they were instrumental nonetheless in the writing of this report. In particular, access management for the chapter four of the access management manual talked about the idea of a layered network, which you can see demonstrated on the figure on the right. The idea would be to have a complete network for all modes and then identify areas where priority would need to take place for each network. Let me, uh, this is Gary, and let me just, ah, I see that you're going to be talking about that, but just uh, to reiterate uh, something that I do in most of uh, my training sessions is that to say access management is not just uh, closing driveways and closing median openings because uh, it's all about choice and it's all about that network that Nathan has been talking about uh, whether it is a way for cyclists to uh, make their trip on a less trafficked road or if it is even for trucks that are able to go around the corner and make a left-hand turn at a signal rather than uh, straight out on the road. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Gary. And as you can see from the figure that just came up, this is from the, this is currently a draft, but it is, would be from the Complete Streets Handbook. It does kind of show that idea is already being discussed with the idea of a complete network. You can see the transit corridor in pink, the bicycling network in green, and the freight route in the gray, along with the sidewalks on the, on the roadways. And in CHRP 659, it talks about uh, driveways and how some of these driveways would need to change based off of area type. As you can see here in the urban core, the pedestrian and transit routes are considered to have a higher importance with less emphasis for bicycles and automobiles. But with the advent of bike share systems in many cities nowadays, some, city, some major cities possibly may need to classify the bicycle as a higher mode of, uh, of importance. Another 
important policy from uh, came from the Smart Transportation Guidebook from New Jersey and PennDOT. This figure shows how different contexts or contexts should be def should be defined based off of different land use contexts themselves. Looking at it a little, a little bit closer, you can see the differences between at the suburban center and the town center themselves. The changes in density units, building coverage, block dimensions, height, and setback are all very different and sh shine a light on how to classify these different areas, which is useful as it can allow for greater flexibility for possibly designing roadways. And finally, we have the FDOT Freight Roadway roadway design considerations document. This document is important in that it's similar to the previous document, but has a greater focus on the freight activity and livability matrix here shows the different four areas, community oriented, low activity, freight, and diverse activity. We'll talk more about this though later in the presentation. And with this, I will pass it off to Martin Guttenplan, who will go through the rest of the presentation uh, today. Thank you, Nathan. Um, be before I, I jump right in, I do want to say um, we're going to go into a little more detail now. And if people have questions, um, you can type them in the, uh, in the question pane or uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, more likely we'll catch it if, it's, uh, if you do it through the question pane. Um, Nathan will try to handle your questions directly, um, but if we get a, a number of questions along the way, we'll, we may stop and, uh, and, and have a discussion at that point. And if that doesn't occur, we'll, we'll, we'll have a, a time for a Q&A at the end. With that, um, let me go into chapter two of the report, which is uh, different topics within access considerations. And as you can see by the, um, by the figure here, that um, we cover a lot of different topics, uh, driveways by context and mode, intersections, signalization. I'm not going to read them all, but um, you can, we'll, we, we will go over these now. Um, so with this um, chapter, uh, chapter two, we start out with, with some of the major access considerations and, and possible solutions. Um, that can be applied more widely in Florida. Uh, the next few slides will all be uh, like this, and they're directly from the report. And the idea is to bring people in visually to, to some of the concepts. Um, for some of you, this is um, you know, very familiar and you, your bread and butter, and some of you, it, it may not be. So it's, it shows uh, examples of with sidewalks, um, and how it relates with transit stops that if, if they're not connected, um, you create a very hazardous situation for those in, in wheelchairs and the like. Uh, and this, this next one um, shows uh, the effect of, of sidewalks going through uh, driveway aprons. Um, though we're glad to see in both of these that the sidewalk is continued through the driveway, the one on the left where the, 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 the flare is just one long seven degree slope um, creates a, a hazard for anyone in a wheelchair, particularly a manual wheelchair, or if you don't have the strength as you're going along there, you'll be, um, you'll be sent right into the, into the street. Uh, and there's a lot of guidance out there uh, on how to do this, and we go through that in the report. Uh, some other common problems we see um, regarding sidewalks is getting to the building from the sidewalk that you're trying to. And on the left, you can see that there, there is no 
uh, access by sidewalk, pedestrians forced into the road. And what's even worse is if they wanted to put a sidewalk there, uh, that opportunity has been removed with uh, or made extremely difficult with uh, the power poles and, and, and lighting poles that are there. So the idea is, you know, think this through from the beginning, get it into your regulations, and then you got to follow through and make sure that what's uh, actually being uh, proposed meets what's in your regulations. Um, in terms of better site planning for pedestrians, um, the red, the red uh, line here illustrates the, the drive-through traffic for this McDonald's in Oakland, and the yellow illustrates the pedestrian access, and the main roadway access is on the right. And so if a pedestrian wants to walk along walk in from the sidewalk, uh, they're going to be encountering drive-through traffic from two different uh, sources. Uh, and it, it makes for a very um, potentially dangerous situation, particularly if the driver's juggling a cup of coffee and a hamburger and the phone rings and poor pedestrian is looking at his or her phone uh, while walking and you have a recipe for spilled coffee at the worst, at the uh, least. Um, here we turn the picture uh, around 90 degrees, and you can see they've, they've routed the drive-through traffic so it goes uh, behind and then also to the side of the store. And that, that creates a much uh, safer situation for all uh, parties involved. And this is that same McDonald's uh, from the street view. And you can see here with the yellow, the pedestrian has pretty uh, clear access uh, into the store. And the drive the drive through traffic uh, circles around behind. And, and from above, you can see that as well. Another. Um, issue at, at, at driveway and sidewalk inter intersections is for the driver to be actually be able to see the pedestrian or even uh, more critically if there's a, a bicyclist traveling faster on the sidewalk. And uh, we've spoken with Joel Provenzano with District 7 and he's uh, given us his, his uh, regular rule of thumb is to provide at least 20 feet uh, clear sight triangle at the at at the driveways so that uh, a motorist can see the pedestrian and that can may need to be adjusted if the stop bar is back further or um, other stuff you know sight conditions and using that same figure we showed uh, earlier with the McDonald's you can see that uh, that fence post that's uh, shown in the triangle uh, propose, uh, poses a, a visibility issue for, the, for pedestrians if the, if the driver is exiting that driveway. We're going to move on into intersection design now. And with that, we found a lot of good guidance from the North Carolina document, Complete Streets uh, document and uh, some others. But one of the key things about this uh, North Carolina document is that it, it's a comprehensive approach to those uh, to intersection design um, where it looks at uh, quality of service for each of the modes, looking at the driver expectations, um, and uh, a, a focus on creating order for each crossing by minimizing conflict. So it's, it's, it, it, it gives the designer um, a lot of guidance on what to be looking for. And it also, to its credit, indicates that you know, intersections are complex. You can't just do a cookie cutter design uh, and suit all different modes. 
well. Another um, document that we uh, pull from heavily um, is a draft code from Orange County, uh, the Orange Code, and this is the iDrive District Overlay. And this, what we found in this document is that there's very specific uh, guidance for design elements that uh, do a good job of protecting pedestrians and and looking at all the modal users. Um, this one, uh, this illustration is about uh, turning radius and one of the, the things that's notable here is that they're they're saying that uh, in location you want to be designing um, for your typical design vehicle versus a maximum design vehicle. Um, if, if, if you're getting one truck a day you don't want to uh, you know put a 40-foot radius here um, if there's a lot of pedestrian access because it makes those crossings that much uh, longer and more difficult. I'll show you a couple more pictures. Um, it provides uh, maximum distances for crossings before a landscape median is reply, required. Um, it gives uh, specific directions for bulb outs and, and the like. And we'll be visiting this code uh, uh, elsewhere in the presentation. Uh, the next section is on signal spacing and from here, here we go to North Carolina um, and they provide some pretty good guidance on, on signal spacing so that you maintain the appropriate pace or the flow of the platoons and the motor vehicles and still allow uh, opportunities for, for, for crossing. Um, this chart is kind of the heart of it. I'll take a minute to, um, to walk you through it just to show the, the type of thought process that's gone in. We're just going to look at the urban and suburban and one of the th things about uh, the North Carolina is in addition to um, defining the context in terms of area type, they also uh, further break that out by, by street type uh, using a more newer, uh, new urbanist type of lexicon with uh, Main Street, Avenue, Boulevard, etc. So say we have an avenue in an urban suburban location that's um, that's would be the equivalent of an arterial, but had uh, you know it's because it's in that location, its speed limit is in that 25 to 35 range, but it carries a lot of traffic. It's high volume, so and it it's its uh, density is is only medium. So you would go down here and you'd see high volume uh, means greater than 20,000 vehicles per day. Moderate density is one to three signals per mile, or a 400 to 1,000 foot uh, average spacing between the access points, and then uh, five to 15 access points per mile on each side of the street. So it's very, very specific. Um, we're not saying that this is the answer uh, for Florida, but it is a good way of. Um, of, of uh, keeping track uh, of all these different variables and how they relate. This is, this is Gary Sokolo and I just wanted to reiterate uh, what Martin's saying and that is uh, the purpose of this report wasn't to answer our questions because um, we don't have that new guidance. We have recommendations that we're working on, but we uh, went uh, all over the country uh, to find how other uh, state governments, local governments have been dealing with the issue uh, that uh, Martin has been showing you. Thanks, Gary. You're welcome. 
Um, one place that um, FDOT does um, a pretty good job already is with mid-block crossing guidance, guidance and medians as well. Uh, the median handbook and the traffic engineering uh, manual uh, have quite a bit on location, volume, etc. There's always room for improvement and there's also guidance on signalization and supplemental beacons, uh, rapid rectangular flashing beacons, etc. Um, to supplement that, uh, again, we've gone back to North Carolina, and they have um, their context-based approach to roadway designs. Um, when it comes to mid-block crossings, they're only showing them on avenues and boulevards, and they're only recommending them when generators exist, and they're specific about the closest signal has to be more than 300 feet away. So they... Um, and then we've uh, taken some of the, the, the Florida practice and, and captured it as well. Um, for those of you who followed Gary and Deborah Tyrone's slides over the last year or two, this is, a, this is where we, we borrowed from. But in this, in this case, we're showing a transit stop on both sides of a roadway with directional me median openings. And that creates, um, if a pedestrian wants to, you know, if you get off the bus in the morning or in the evening and you got on the bus on this side of the roadway, you got to cross back over. If you were to cross directly where you would expect to cross, um, there's a little, little tiny, uh, maybe two foot snaky uh, island that you could, you could pause on if you're lucky enough to have that balance in case there was too much traffic to get back across. So one of the solutions that they used in, in District 7 along Bush Boulevard is they moved one of the, the bus stops and they ran a crosswalk, a, a diagonal crossing between the bus stops and this way there's, there's a much bigger island in the middle uh, if you needed to break up your crossing. And this is really important on, you know, a six-lane arterial, arterial like Bush. Um, otherwise, uh, someone was, if they wanted to get back to this side in the afternoon, they'd have to go down here, all the way to the signal, back up, down this way, or, uh, you know, risk, risk, balancing on this little strip of concrete. And you know which one they're going to do. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, they're all going to go this way, Gary. Absolutely. We would not ever imagine anybody uh, breaking the law. Right. Okay. Um, this next section in the book uh, deals with modal synergies and trade-offs. And the idea is how, uh, uh, addresses how solution for one mode uh, can also benefit other modes or it could also hinder other modes. Um, we pulled together some of the, the literature, uh, we pulled together uh, a few different sources and, and show the sidewalk zones uh, uh, picture which shows basically assigning a place for the different parts of the of the sidewalk and pedestrian zone. Um, this slide can can, uh, can show you some of the the issues when you have uh, encroachment on um, on the pedestrian zone. Um, yeah, and if you were, if it were a transit stop it, as well, which it is, uh, there's not even a paved landing area. So if you were uh, in a wheelchair getting out there, you would have quite a, have to undergo quite a, quite a challenge. Um, another 
treatment that's used uh, periodically around the country is connecting cul-de-sacs. And it's, it's a lot easier to do with new development um, where you don't have to gain the access between the cul-de-sacs and the, the through someone's property. But if, if you can do it, it makes a huge difference because it then provides an incentive for using um, walking or bicycling because you save a lot of uh, time and distance because you can access directly versus uh, having to go around um, a circuitous uh, network to get out or climbing someone's fence. And the one more um, Florida example uh, for modal synergies and trade-offs. Um, for those of you who've been in the in the field for a while, you, you know that um, bicyclists traveling on sidewalks, particularly when they're tra traveling counter to the flow of vehicles, um, are at uh, quite a risk for not being seen because they're not anticipated by a driver, uh, particularly if they're going quickly. So um, again, Joel Provenzano in District 7 and some of the folks down there came up with an, an uh, uh, a warning system with uh, a sign that says watch for turning vehicles and then a pavement marking that went well went went with it and so there are countermeasures to alert the bicyclists to be aware that motorists may not see them and uh, the first couple of first years they did this they did it along 50 they did six and a half miles of road 50 signs but um, they had very good results, 71% reduction in crashes where the sign was installed. That's uh, car bike crashes. So you can see that they've had, they haven't uh, compiled the numbers on more, on more recent years since the program was expanded, but um, it definitely is promising and may be worth uh, following up with in, in your area. Um, as far as transit access, uh, the Florida Accessing Transit um, Handbook has a lot of uh, very good uh, detailed guidance on transit access. And the, the handbook draws, our, our report draws pretty heavily from that, but also with um, backup and, and a little bit of uh, variety from, from other sources as well. Um, there's a discussion about, about lane width that that is more flexible than just buses need a 12-foot lane and talks about the different modal users as well. Um, it provides guidance on turning radii for transit vehicles. You know, if you have a bike, a bike rack on the front, they generally need three feet more to make that turn, etc. And our um, bus stop spacing and location are, are critical. Um, and th this slide will show, uh, it, here we have uh, the original stops and you can see where the, where the main users are, uh, the shopping center and the big box store. And so when the stops are moved mid-block, in this case, um, and if there's sufficient volumes of all uh, mid-block island and signal, um, it makes it a lot um, easier to both access the transits and, and also um, access the, um, the main generators as well. So this was a, this is kind of a win-win type of situation. And 
lastly with bus stops is uh, is the remembering that that bus stops shouldn't be within driveways and that um, if you have a bus stop right where there's a driveway you're you're setting up uh, for, for conflicts one of the um, the, this next section is block access and design. And this, this is somewhere where the iDistrict uh, drive overlay code provides a lot of uh, good guidance on different types of block access and maximum, uh, maximum distances, whether it be uh, perimeters uh, uh, and also for block faces greater than 500 feet. Um, pedestrian passage being required. So it, it's, it's a well thought out uh, modern code. In addition, there's um, uh, attention paid to providing uh, pedestrian access between the sidewalk and building entrances. And while we're on pet access to businesses, um, these, these are a couple of slides from, from Daytona Beach where we've got uh, mid-block or we've got beach access here, hotels and uh, Publix and where you're going to have a, a fair amount of pedestrian and transit access. They went through and uh, installed a mid-block crossing signalized and then continue it um, straight across through the parking lot well protected you see the wheel stops keep the the, the cars from uh, going into the the pedestrian way and that's a, a blow up of that pedestrian view so it, it can be done it is done it's it's a matter of um, of insisting on on good design. Back to I the uh, I drive overlay zone. Um, we're here. Um, it's talking about uh, um, block length standards and driveway considerations. Um, you know what's expected alley configurations so again we're getting it gets very specific with its guidance by by context type and so this this is useful as a as a jumping off place for um, for other cities to consider And other uh, considerations uh, would be uh, for freight traffic, where you have bicycles and freight, uh, freight traffic sharing the same space. Um, it might make sense if you can't separate the two to utilize um, a buffered bike lane, and preferably something wider than, than just the two-foot buffer that's the FDOT standard, so that uh, bicyclists aren't uh, as affected by the by the blast effect of of trucks and the freight drivers um, have a little more confidence that the bike's not going to end up under their wheels. Um, this is another uh, type of the treatment that's used uh, around the country, where you want to keep the the driveway throat small to to maintain um, slower turning speeds and shorter pedestrian crossings yet there are uh, some some truck deliveries involved so in this case they use this uh, textured concrete area that's reinforced to to carry truck traffic so the truck can can uh, go over that portion when it's making the turn so it 
it's uh, one of these win-win uh, type of situations. And Martin, this is Gary, yeah. and I don't know if you're going to be mentioning it in detail later on, but the whole issue of driveway design uh, to help uh, and at least to understand the needs of, of all users who may cross it is still in its infancy. Uh, we really were not sure. Uh, even though the, the NCHRP did that report a few years ago, um, I believe we're still going to need uh, some more research on this. And uh, so far, we have no easy answers on what would be the best uh, design of driveway uh, for different sorts of uses. Um, so just putting my two cents in there. Yeah. Yeah, oh man. We we went combing everywhere looking for anything research based on this and it's just not out there. Um I we went to the Dutch. <laughs> we went everywhere. Um I think there are people who in their wisdom know what to do, but it's not it's not necessarily codified or backed up with research yet. And there's a lot of wise people that disagree on it too that's that's not been easy either yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. we have some long email chains on this <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I do think that there are some general principles that that we do a, a reasonable job of, of underscoring in the report that that people could follow Um, this this chart's actually I, I think it's from the median handbook, or is, no the driveway handbook. And Gary adopted this with Russell Stover on suggested design criteria based on truck or large vehicle use, and you know it begins to uh, to look at you know what. How much space do you want to uh, allocate for which vehicle? Which should be the design vehicle? And we, we reference this in the report in a few places. Hey, Martin. Yes. Uh, we did have a question earlier uh, regarding the uh, pedestrian crossings and mid-blocks. And mm -hmm. the question was, do developers incur any cost for the proposed pedestrian crossings? Uh, this is Gary, and um, I can't say that I know uh, whether, for instance, Publix built that pedestrian crossing, uh, but I, I would guess that they did since it was so well lined up with their, um, their aisle uh, that goes through their parking lot. Uh, we... Uh, um, at this point, it's kind of early in the stages. It's one of the things we're looking at is is how to uh, address pedestrian issues in the the access permitting process, and uh, we are still in our infancy on that. Uh, we have been lucky, however, that uh, there are a number of uh, developers, and Publix is one of them. Uh, that understand that pedestrian access is very important to their business and would not have a problem building a uh, pedestrian refuge uh, because they know it really is going to help their bottom line. So, uh, but no, we don't have uh, anywhere within our site impact or guidance on uh, traffic studies for permitting, uh, anything solid on that yet. At this point, um, uh, we have been depending on the kindness of uh, strangers and developers. So um, 
but we will be looking at this more because uh, the safety of all users is something that uh, is impacted by, by new developments and, and our permitting process. And uh, we've had suggestions to change some of our administrative rules to specifically mention that. Uh, so we would have a lot more like statutory standing on that. Uh, I believe we have statutory standing right now, but it, a lot of it is what, how long of a fight you want you want to have on this. But again, you know, Publix uh, and uh, Walmart uh, have have done some really good things that benefit pedestrians. Great, thanks, Gary. Thanks. That's good discussion. Um, the next chapter uh, in the handbook deals with uh, context-based planning and design, and looks at uh, con context-based planning solutions. Um, we'll talk a little bit about using the F dots draft complete streets context zones, and the um, create roadway design considerations guide guidance. Uh, some of the relationships between some of these different context schemas and um, examples from other states. Um, though it's in pink, it's still um, what's in the current um, draft of the FDOT um, uh, context zones. But the idea here is that they, the FDOT ones are are are, are um, very similar to ones that have been that Nathan was showing in earlier documents, and uh, the idea of uh, say for instance the C4 general urban it's mixed use um, single family multifamily, uh, but one thing about about these um, implementation contact zones is that they use a number of, of different um, uh, criteria that you see um, used elsewhere, but they also provide good guidance on how to implement, how to measure and implement. Um, so you'd have to go to the, the actual a handbook to get the the real detail, but um, it provides um, you know measures such as intersection density, lock perimeter, lock length, uh, a lot of these factors that help define what what context zone you're in. Um, Um, the other uh, document we've uh, at least spoken a little bit about is the uh, FRDC or Freight Roadways Design Consideration uh, document. And it basically sets up these quadrants. It's designed to, to guide the design and implementation uh, for that, that, that work for both freight and um, livable community type of approaches. So if you've got uh, this area in the upper left, the, the, the C, the high, con the high community area where livability is high, um, you're going to be dealing with freight in a different way than if you're down in uh, a low pedestrian bike livability area uh, and there's a lot of freight orientation. And so it, it provides guidance on, on how to mix, how to make these, these uses um, coexist. And as you would imagine, that area of high freight activity and high community activity is going to 
pose the, the greatest challenges. Um, one of the things that is being discussed now in the department is how to um, overlay the two, uh, the freight zones and the um, contact zones. Uh, as we were talking about, you know, that, that area where we've got uh, C5 urban, uh, urban, and um, also a fair amount of uh, business driveway locations, and, uh, and it, it, it poses some challenges. So this, this Uh, this shows kind of uh, graphically a little bit how that all fits together. Uh, I mean, the, um, this one slide could could be the um, entire webinar, so we'll we'll move along. But just know that there's some guidance there, and there's resources to 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 assist. Um, in terms of other states, we're back in North Carolina again. And one of the things that North Carolina does, and it's probably done elsewhere, it may even be done in, in some districts, and that's where they have a design input team to ensure that um, facility users are represented throughout the life of the project. So it goes from planning all the way through construction. It's not just um, one stage, and there they, you know, they define. That's the group that helps de define the transportation context, uh, the character of the street, the modal users, the goals and objectives, and to do that, um, uh, the handbook um, propo provides these different uh, sheets. Uh, for instance, this is an urban, suburban main street, and they provide a plan view. Uh, they describe the key elements, um, and then they lay out the different zones. If we mentioned earlier, so the bicycle zone, the motor vehicle zone, all, those, all that is shown clearly in these uh, visual sheets. And then they also provide a cross-section that does that. And they do it and provide uh, guidance on, on recommended uh, widths for those different zones. So what, what should be the sidewalk zone, the green zone, the parking zone. So there's a lot of, of guidance. And it's based by. Um, the urban suburban street and it's within three different contexts and then if you dig deeper there's even more 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 detail and that's you know usually the most important part another um, uh, uh, example from this one was from Summit County, Ohio, which is a fairly suburban um, area, but they wanted to update their access management uh, guidance and rules, and they wanted it to be based on context, not just speed and signal spacing. So one of the things that they, that they did is they, they set up um, this suburban retrofit roadway uh, category, so that so that a strip could could redevelop into um, somewhere that is more uh, hospitable um, to uh, pedestrian, bicycle, and uh, a higher density type of uh, location, and. They're, interestingly, their their um, their motivation was because that type of development 
generates uh, greater tax revenue. So that's how they, uh, one way they managed to push this through. Uh, this is a chart, and again, the numbers don't matter. I, I shouldn't say the numbers are not guidance for Florida per se, but what I wanted to show is that um, they're showing spacing uh, between on, if you compare the spacing on some of these with their, uh, with the other suburban, it allows for uh, um, uh, closer spacing of driveways and, and intersections and the like to allow for um, greater access. Can I, this is Gary, and I'll, I'll just also point out, like, like yeah. Martin said, uh, don't look at the numbers so much, which I think are a bit weird, um, but do look at the format. Uh, and even though we go for more accessibility in, in downtown areas, and they, uh, um, uh, in a downtown area, actually driveways are pretty sparse. Uh, that's because the, the pedestrians do actually, um, even even here in Tallahassee, uh, take precedence over. Uh, cars crossing to get into parking. Uh, parking is usually, uh, for automobiles, is usually on the side street. And this is on purpose. It's been that way, you know, for a hundred years. So, um, got to imagine that downtowns have good accessibility, good access, but they also have pretty stringent access management standards uh, when it comes to driveways. Uh, one of the things that um, Martin showed a few slides ago uh, was uh, block spacing, and so you can you can see if you're familiar with our access management standards that block spacing of 500 feet it, it, actually it um, uh, our standards are way too stringent for that. Yet a 500 uh, foot block spacing has has many good uh, safety and efficiency features uh, for both pedestrians as well as automobiles. Thank you. Thank you. And so, in our quest for for other ways of doing things. Gary was making a presentation to the International Road Congress, I think, um, down in South Africa. He does, you know, he makes these world worldwide junkets, you know, several times a year. And Somebody has to do it. That's right. Know, and uh, <laughs> they'll, they'll, uh, For all of you that uh, either work for the DOT or taxpayers know that it was all done at my own expense on vacation time. Uh, we haven't been able to, to travel like that in a long, long time. And being the dedicated public servant he is, he came back with um, a lot of, of really good guidance that, that is coming from down in South Africa. And th these uh, Western Cape guidelines are very, uh, it, it's a very complete approach. And there's, there's a lot to be, uh, to be explored there. Um, you know, be, they, they set up five different roadway classes, the six is a walkway, and then the function of mobility versus access and then they they go through and you know put the, the the description of the of the of the functional class, but uh, we'll take this a little deeper. Um, so then they talk about the roadside development environment, which shall be abbreviated RDE in some of the other slides. And here they start to get um, a little more specific, and in some cases a little different from what we've seen elsewhere. So you've got CBD, and then you have this intermediate zone, and then suburban. And you see some numbers that look pretty familiar. 
Uh, these are, you know, converted, but um, you you see these numbers um, elsewhere in other types of documents, and they they break it out rural and semi-rural as well, and then. Um, there's guidance on, on driveway permitting, and you can see in, in the um, you know, predominantly urban, urban and urbanized areas, um, no conventional driveways are allowed. And conventional um, mean high volume driveway, low volume driveway, and domestic equivalent driveway. So these are more uh, not the not the convert the commercial type driveways necessarily, or maybe getting myself into trouble. Oh, there, those are metric driveways. Just just remember that. Yeah. <laughs> and, <those> are, <laughs> and they're me metric spaces. So when you see the f 500 uh, at the bottom there, know that it's uh, it's it's uh, meters uh, rather than 500 feet. Right, right. And they draw and they drive on the wrong side there, so I yeah. don't know. Yeah. Hey, I missed that one. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to get them all. Yeah, that's why the I main, said those are those are metric driveways. <laughs> yeah. The the main thing is that there there are some there there's some nuance between uh, just urban and rural. Etc. And it's and, and it's well thought out. And then this, they they there there are charts and charts and charts in the report. This is just for what we would call a class three roadway in a CBD um, environment or intermediate and suburban. Um, they provide spacing and feet between between a signalized intersection and an unsignalized intersection, a high volume driveway and a signalized intersection. It's, it's, so, so it's very specific. Um, again, the numbers aren't uh, for us necessarily, but the, the classification scheme has possibilities to consider. And then um, lastly, uh, Gary, um, I, I think, in his way of uh, trying to piece together some of this type of guidance with the DOT context zones, has come up with uh, these draft tables that a few of us have uh, provided input on. And basically, this one is dealing with uh, driveway design and placement within the different DOT context zones, and so in this one, we're going to look at what the driveway uh, features and considerations are within um, that uh, C2T, the rural town, which is a unique uh, category for, for Florida. And the idea is to minimize driveways, uh, to allow for ped, a good pedestrian environment. Uh, principle is to keep the sidewalk level across the driveway space, um, that the flare or the apron not cross the sidewalk zone. I don't know if you recall that one of the first slides we showed how the the sidewalk crosses the driveway apron. One in one case it went down. And in another case, it stayed level, um, and that, when possible, vehicular access through the side and back, and that DOT work to uh, reinforce local network connectivity so that everything doesn't have to go on those uh, main streets. Similarly. Um, We've included a draft for the for median openings, and with this example, we'll show um, the uh, the seat the the commercial suburban, 
and here, um, you know, provide, and that's you know, kind of, kind of like this area, uh, providing turn lanes at the median openings, uh, retrofitting any contin continuous left turn lanes, um, making sure that turning radii is appropriate uh, for loading, and uh, assuring that there's a good mid-block crossing. So that's kind of a, a picture of where we may be going or could be going. And uh, we welcome uh, feedback on this uh, as when this report's actually released. And with that, I'm going to turn this over uh, to Amy Longstreet who was the principal author of, of, of a lot of the policy portions of the document. And I'm going to give her control, or at least try, i got to take away my pointer, or at least try to. And OK, Amy. All right, thank you, Martin. As part of the review of potential short-term implementation actions that could be bet that could best implement access management and complete streets efforts, a review of existing FDOT policies and the Florida Building Code was conducted. As depicted in the table provided, there are several existing FDOT policies that can be updated to address access management and complete streets. I won't go through all of them listed here, however, among them are the primary access management policy, the context sensitive solution policy, the safe mobility for life policy, and the comprehensive plan review policy. Okay. This, uh, this slide goes over the short-term policy implementation policies, um, including uh, the main access management planning policy, um, the contact-sensitive solutions policy, um, as well as the Safe Mobility for Life program policy as mentioned earlier. Um, and then on the right hand side you can see the proposed revisions to these policies. We also looked outside the FDOT for other FAC rules that would support actions implementing access management and complete streets efforts. Among these codes was Chapter 2 and 32 of the Florida Building Code. This code discussed accessible routes and pedestrian walkways. Modification of these rules to work in tandem with FDOT rules and efforts would go a long way to address and implement access management and complete streets efforts through design flexibility. In Chapter 5, we also looked at long-term policy implementation and in doing so also looked at several FDOT policy documents that are either currently under revision to include, to include complete street policy, policy issues or slated for revision. These documents are listed here and would be instrumental towards that effort. Also, as part of long-term policy implementation, additional documents, standards, and, re and rules were reviewed. From this review, we recommended changes to these documents would also better align existing rules and codes with access management and complete streets design goals and objectives. This slide provides an analysis table developed to review existing FDOT, FDOT rules as they relate to long-term implementation of access management and complete streets revisions. 
Among these rules are the connections permit rule, the main access management rule, and the use of right of way rule. The legend at the bottom provides the assessed current status of these rules as they relate to ongoing efforts to update documents on the left side of the table. Additional long-term policy and procedure review conducted as part of the document included analysis of long-term policy implementation included in the policies and procedures provided along the top of this table, as well as the compared documents within the left-hand column. The legend at the bottom again provides the assessed current status of these rules as they relate to ongoing efforts to update the documents um, in relation to the complete streets effort. To further our efforts looking at long-term policy implementation, we also looked at other agency rules and codes and compared their inclusion in FDOT documents. Other agency rules reviewed include the Florida Department of Business and Professional Regulations Building Code, as mentioned earlier, um, and within that, Chapter 4, Section 42, which requires pedestrian access within building projects. We also looked at the Florida Department of Economic Opportunities, Rule 9B-7.0042, which ensures that pedestrian and mobility impaired access is addressed. This rule is cross-referenced in several FDOT um, documents and in the building code documents. Um, now I'll open up uh, the webinar for discussion if there are any questions. Thanks, Amy. We actually do have a question from earlier. Um, uh, Gary Kramer asked us if we have a criteria spreadsheet that, to rank streets that are candidates for complete streets Im implementation that other communities or MPOs have used. Um, Martin or Gary, do you know if we if there is any sort of spreadsheet out there or anything that we could send? This is Gary. Um, I'm uh, uh, answering, trying to answer the question for another Gary, Gary Kramer, and um, if what you are looking for are the detailed criteria for our, our transect or our contact zones for Florida DOT, yeah, we can share that with you. Um, it's, it's pretty detailed, uh, and it'll show you uh, what um, you know, block size, uh, how far the building is from the sidewalk, uh, uh, any number of things like you've seen in other uh, transect contact zone type type work. Yeah, that's not a problem. We can give that to you. Um, I'd like to point out something. Uh, uh, yeah, I uh, would like to point out something that. Uh, it, it's really hard to to uh, describe uh, candidates for complete streets means that there is this kind of street that's in your mind that is a complete street and the rest of them aren't um, and we're trying to get away from that I mean complete streets really is is all about the context and you know that sometimes downtowns uh, yeah, you will have wide sidewalks and and shops that that have uh, seating for the restaurants on those sidewalks. Yeah, that does happen. But uh, a, a suburban multi-lane at grade arterial um, is not going to look that way, and it shouldn't. Uh, and uh, they're all complete streets. They all serve that context, um, and that's part of what we're trying to to get through. Now, if what you're looking for is that spreadsheet that shows you the how to find what a, an urban uh, center or urban uh, whatever the the most 
uh, urban sections are, yeah, we got that and we can make sure that you get the most up-to-date Florida DOT um, uh, description of our context zones. Um, and uh, I, um, at this point, Dwayne Carver, who is our, um, he is like our, our main person for Complete Streets. I am making him an organizer. And um, Dwayne, so you can, uh, if you have a, if, whether you're on the phone or a, a, have a headset, um, you can definitely add to this discussion uh, much better than I can. So, uh, Dwayne, I'm going to unmute you, and you should be able to speak on the phone. Okay, can you hear me? Absolutely great. Okay, terrific. Well, I think that's a, that's a very good question, and the way the department is looking at this is that um, for in the future for us, basically all projects, certainly all non-limited access projects will be considered complete streets projects. And our goal by doing that is to make this, the street or the roadway match the context where it's located. And so if you wanted to identify uh, what you might consider to be you know, future complete streets projects, to me what that would mean is identifying those streets that are, that are most important in your community that don't currently match the context where they're located. So if you have for us, a, a downtown street, but the characteristics of that of that street didn't match a downtown location. It was too fast. It was too wide. It didn't have enough uh, provision for the modes, for instance. That's the kind of complete street that most folks think of, and, and certainly that would be a good candidate for it. But also, uh, if you have a, a you know a roadway in a neighborhood setting, uh, maybe it doesn't have sidewalk cafes, but uh, it needs to have. Um, a bike lane or maybe it needs to have on-street parking added or the speeds are too fast, that's also a context mismatch. So that could be a candidate for uh, becoming a more complete street. You could even look at rural roadways. If you have rural er roads in your areas, uh, but they don't provide for all the modes, let's say they uh, would benefit from having a wider shoulder or uh, something to provide for bicyclists there, maybe have uh, uh, that kind of facility added to them, then uh, you know, they could be made more complete and match their context better and provide for all the users by, uh, by having those changes made to them. So in each of those contexts, the, the road will look a little different, but it still becomes a complete street. So uh, when, to me, when a community is thinking in terms of how do we, uh, you know, identify roads for to become complete streets, you start by looking at, well, what land uses and, and types of land uses do we have in our community, and then how does our transportation system match or not match those? And then you start looking at uh, those projects that you want to, uh, you know, bring them into sync with each other. You're only looking at about. Does that answer your question, Gary? Yes, that does. Yes, that okay. does. And I was going to ask you: Do we have a? Uh, um, a, 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 you know, that table of context zones where we are headed as a State Department of Transportation, um, any that that's up to date uh, that, that we can share to the people on line today? Uh, I'm looking to see if we have those on flcompletestreets.com and um, let me look on our interim products. And see if we have that right. right there. Um, what we have is the uh, what we're going to call the context classifications. We don't actually have the uh, the the specific types of things that with that table that Martin was showing that's in your in your draft hand. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm it's I'm there. Uh, but I'm happy to share what I've done. Right, and, you know, and but uh, I was going to say we, we will be releasing. Right, and we will be releasing this uh, draft handbook um, in March to uh, to our external partners to look at, and, and you'll have a chance to see uh, what those uh, what those categories look like there. What we did with that is we took the the basic SMART code. If you've done form-based coding, you're familiar with the SMART code. We took the SMART code criteria 
and then calibrated those for the conditions that we actually have in Florida to try to make them match more closely to the preponderance of conditions that we have across the state of Florida. So um, they're, they're rougher around the edges than the ones that are in the smart code. The ones in the smart code can be very finely tuned to your particular community. Um, and um, the ones what that is we this, have... Uh, explain the smart code to those of us that don't know what it is. The, the smart code is, a, is actually a, a free form-based code that you can you can download and calibrate it for your community uh, or you could you could pay to have someone come in and, and do that for you which may be a better solution um, but it's the base code to develop a form-based code that allows you to help your community figure out what it wants to be and then what that would look like and then you actually code to get the form that you want to have um, okay. so rather than being a use-based code it's a form-based code it's a free code but it uses a transect system which is what our context zones are based on context classifications are based on that same system so anybody who's done form-based coding is familiar with smart codes and transects and that kind of stuff will be able to use what we're doing at the department pretty easily okay um, let me uh, there was a question that came came on here uh, just a few moments ago and I'm going to uh, give it to you Wayne Duane and uh, the question is uh, when will there be a, um, a, a guidance document from us FDOT available to the public you mentioned external partners but I didn't know who that included I see. That will be the general public, and we'll put it out on flcompletestreets.com as soon as it's ready. Um, we had an internal draft that was released in October, and we just spent uh, a couple of months touring all of the FDOT districts and getting feedback from the districts on, on the handbook. Uh, we received over a thousand comments. Uh, many of those were the same comments because people in the different districts would comment on the same things. But um, we're revising that to, to make sure uh, that we incorporate those comments. Uh, a lot of them were based on uh, the district's interactions with their MPOs and, and their local governments and said, well, you know, based on the people that I work with all the time, when they read this, this is what they would think, or they would have more questions about this, we think. So we're, we're trying to tune that up as best we can, and then it will be released uh, to, the, to the general public at the end of March uh, for folks to take a look at, and they'll have a, uh, a few weeks to look at that, and then we'll do a final version of it that will go out. And then we'll have the uh, context classifications in there. It'll describe the process that we use to determine those and then how those are used on projects. It'll also describe what uh, local governments can do to um, to help further complete streets and what can be done on the, the land use and the land use coding side that uh, is a part of making a complete street. Uh, so we're, we're hoping it'll uh, let us all be on the same page as we're trying to build this way. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to take a moment here to make a plug, Duane, for um, a presentation you gave back in June on uh, what we can do now. And uh, it, it was, a, I think, an excellent presentation that showed that within Florida's uh, plants preparation manual, which does more than tell you how to prepare plans for some reason, um, uh, we have a, a context sensitive design section which really has already codified a lot of what we're trying to do now in the complete streets arena and uh, perhaps if I can get a PDF of uh, Dwayne's report I can uh, put that in there because I really thought it was excellent. I Actually, if you go to flcompletestreets.com and click on the interim products page, mm -hmm. uh, that that presentation is on there. It's uh, it right. presented at the Design Expo this this past June, and yeah. um, and uh, you can you can download that and look at it. And keep in mind, if you're talking about local streets as opposed to state roads, you also have Chapter 19 of the Florida Green Book, which is traditional neighborhood design streets. That will allow you to design in areas that are tr traditionally difficult to design in uh, using our standards because it, it provides for lower speeds, narrower lane widths, uh, it has details on on-street parking, a lot of the things that uh, we've typically not had very good guidance on at the state level uh, are now in the Green Book. And in the new uh, FDOT design manual, which will come out next year, we'll have that kind of guidance in that book as well. So even on state roads, we'll have better guidance for how to do these things 
Uh, but today, Fantastic. on your local streets, you can do that as well. Yeah, I, I want to point out that Nathan Hicks has texted uh, or chatted the link to the uh, uh, Florida Complete Streets uh, website that Dwayne was talking about. Thank you, Dwayne. Okay. Thank you. So, Gary, we um, have a few more minutes for you to talk about um, what's coming up. Ah, okay. Can you uh, is it, uh, can you give me? Uh, I think you I think you have control already. Really? All right. I didn't see. Well, let me try. Not take control. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, now I, don't you can... think I have control. Okay. And I am a control freak. Okay, you should have it now. Okay. Ah. Okay. Okay. And yeah, I, I seem to be helping that out. Okay. Let me. Uh, this is a uh, a picture. Is part of the guiding principle. The picture is probably going to change, uh, but the principle behind driveways uh, in different environments uh, is really based on, and this was said before, the importance of different modes in different context zones. Uh, so whereas the uh, in the urban core, uh, they are really serving everybody and uh, going all the way to the rural uh, that uh, uh, freight movement is extremely important. I'm thinking of I-75 uh, south of Payne's Prairie or something like that. And as uh, we pointed out before, uh, the rural town is, is really a, a new uh, addition to the transect. Um, and that's because rural, uh, like we have here in C2, is very different from when you go through a main street of a small town. And uh, small towns in many ways are just like downtown, very similar to your urban core. Um, uh, there are, here's the possible changes to access management practice uh, that um, We've talked about a little bit. Uh, the signal spacing standards might need to be uh, uh, either gotten rid of or revised. Um, signals, we've realized that having wide signal spacing uh, can cause problems. We do need to look at driveway design uh, that serve different users, and uh, you know, we're into the study, but we might actually need. Um, uh, some more research on this, and um, uh, we may need to change our administrative rule to include safe pedestrian access as a necessity in access permitting. So those are the uh, those are probably the three major things you might see changed. Um, this is an unnamed street in Florida, and uh, it has really long signal spacing, and uh, let's talk about what's really good about it. Uh, long signal spacing gives you very, very fast vehicular speeds, um, and uh, it this road carries an amazing amount of vehicular traffic. I'm also going to say that the side streets and back backing network is not bad. It's not bad here. It does have a restrictive median, and that's good for uh, vehicular uh, safety. And, well, where do the long signal spacing on our super arterials miss the target? Well, this road has no sidewalk, and when you have long signal spacing and you have uh, buses uh, that do stop in this area, um, if the person 
uh, lives here, gets on the bus here. At the end of the day, or their, their work day, they're let off over here. And we discussed it before, how many people are going to walk to the signal to come back to their neighborhood? Not many. So um, long signal spacings and uh, protected pedestrian crossings are going. Uh, long signal spacings cause some problems. Uh, and sometimes the mid-block crossing can help it, but uh, sometimes uh, um, extra signals uh, might not be a bad thing, but uh, we believe that should be, uh, let me just say, I believe that should be more of a, a traffic operations issue and not an access management issue. Okay. Those are all things I had to say, and just any more questions or discussion, I'm going to hand it back to uh, Nathan and, and Martin. Great. Thanks, Gary. Now, at the end of this presentation, we do have a lot of links to uh, different reports and manuals that we referenced throughout the the, the, the writing of this report. Uh, whenever we send the presentation and a follow-up email, you'll be able to go and look through these. Um, but in the email that we send itself, you'll also be able to, uh, you'll have these links as well, as well as probably a few other additional ones uh, that we'll include. Thank you. And with that, uh, we will go ahead and wrap up the webinar. If you have any other questions, I don't see any questions in the questions pane, but if you do have other questions for us uh, regarding this or any of the material that was presented today, uh, you can uh, email us at, any, at our email addresses. And uh, thank you for attending today's webinar. Yes, thank you. This is Gary. Appreciate your attendance. With that, we're going to end. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.